That changes a little bit as I as I uh, got into it. So uh, title is uh, still sort of appropriate. I'm still sort of going to talk about institutions. But let's start at the individual because that's what we usually do. A lot of what we've been doing in this conference. <clears throat> Here he is ready to make all sorts of choices about how to live his life, uh, from where to go to school, what job to take, who to marry, or maybe he doesn't marry at all, what friends to have, what's a good vacation, what goods to buy. You know, we often think of him as primarily consumer of uh, lots of goods and some bads. Um, and we like to think of him, we start, I, I start calling him him because that's what we usually do. Um, we like to th think of him as uh, as Garrett said, uh, as a person who can freely make all these choices, right? He comes in with his spreadsheet to the car dealership or whatever, and he, he's calculated all the, all the stuff, even uh, non-economic uh, reasons why he might want uh, one car or another. Um, he's the primary unit of analysis. He's what we're, he's what we're looking at. He's what we're looking to motivate. Um, there it is. He's sort of a uh, somebody called him yesterday a homo economicus or per capitan or, uh, you know, some people on the other side um, call him the unmanageable consumer, right? Um, but he's certainly somebody that everybody is targeting, whether manageable or not. But actually, he's not alone. <laughs> he has a history, for example, a family who's uh, perhaps had a big hand in forming his core beliefs. Um, he's... Oh, let's call he or she, let's, uh, and that's a whole other set of issues that might be brought into uh, what we might call the core beliefs or worldview. Um, has friends as well, right, who, is, who are influencing in various ways. Uh, we talk a lot about social norms in the past couple days. Uh, co-workers who may be friendly or not, uh, may be lined up for him or against him or her. Uh, and various other social systems that he or she is involved in, commuting, uh, vacations, uh, family arguments, uh, whatever. All of these things have a part to play in what uh, he or she chooses to do uh, in his or her life. And then there's a whole other set of influences. Social structures are partly or strongly influenced by technology, right? infrastructure. Uh, it's associated scripts and practices. Technologies are embedded in virtu virtually all of our routines so that we hardly notice sometimes. I think this has been a good experience here to notice how uh, set up our routines are and how different they could be if we have a different set of infrastructures and technologies. Um, Elizabeth Shove and colleagues say, talk about the interpenetration of daily life, household infrastructures, and then all the way to the public and, and private organization of energy supply. So your uh, outlets, right, your stove, your refrigerator, uh, your hair dryer, whatever, um, to wired networks, to power plants, to coal mines and other, and other fuel sources. So energy systems don't just provide conveniences. We like to talk about energy services as though that were something uh, sort of uh, separate, uh, but it's not. Uh, they actually structure our daily lives at home and at work. When the computer network goes down, workers look around for something to do. Uh, when, uh, when, elect the, when the traffic lights get mistimed, people just spend a lot of time in traffic. When a uh, storm comes and the electricity systems goes out, there are always those stories afterwards about how families have discovered, oh, they could play games, you know, or they could read by candlelight or whatever. But it's different when the systems go down. So now we have three elements. The individual agent, social structures, what are called social structures or institutions. I'll start using the term institutions. And technology. All of these things interplay to make those systems which emit greenhouse gases and otherwise damage the planet. Uh, in sociology in my field, there's an old argument about whether an individual can be said to be an active agent, creating his, whole, his own uh, life, or whether social structures and infrastructures uh, compel our actions. 
Are we agents, free agents? Or are we merely reproducers of those structures? Do we just go along with how life is structured? Are we Ayn Rand's hero architect? Or are we Tolstoy's generals? Um, are we, do we have free will? Or are we determined? Much older argument than sociology. But I'm going to stick to sociology. <laughs> this point you'll be relieved to know, having only 12 minutes. Um, in particular, I'll, I'll talk about first two sociologists. And what I'm looking at is to shift the unit of analysis to we started with that individual, and then that individual as the center of something, an individual in a context, whether that's a social context, a technological context, or a social technology technological context. But what I want to do is say all three of these things are important and their interactions are important. Uh, we shouldn't just be targeting the individual. We should be talking about how those social structures and how those technological structures influence what those individuals do. So, and, I'll, and I'm arguing for a theory of practice. Um, Anthony Giddens is a is a, has a theory of practice that he calls structuration, in which agencies and social agent, individual agents and social structures are interactive, and that's their uh, essential characteristic. So the emphasis is not on the individual, it's not on the social structures, it's on those interactions in the practices that accomplish the purposes of our lives. Uh, Pierre Bourdieu, a theory of practice, is a, a famous early book called Outline of a Theory of Practice, um, talks about agents creatively using the ambiguous or contradictory meanings of cultural or physical elements to invoke those symbolic meanings that, that then have uh, result in specific practices such as gift giving, gift exchanging, marriage uh, arranging and other activities um, that are important to people. He introduces the concept of the habitus, which is, uh, takes part in what I'm calling institutions. These are the cognitive, the durably generative, durably installed generative principle, right? So it's your disposition to act. It's the way things are set up. It's the expectations that you have of how you act. Um, so to take an example that will work for, for both of these theories, um, it's perfectly possible to walk into an elevator and stand facing the rear and make meaningful eye contact with all the people in the elevator. But in the face of strong so social expectations that you will, in fact, turn around, face the front, and not make eye contact, that's what most of us do. Most of us don't even talk in an elevator situation, right? We always talk about these elevator messages, but who delivers them, actually? <laughs> Something I've always wondered. OK, so Pierre Bourdieu, the habitus. But the, that habitus has a number of different and overlapping meanings, depending on uh, whether you're talking about domestic structures or uh, political structures and so on. So there's a lot of room for ambiguity and there's a lot of room for improvisation. So even when you're talking about choosing a gift, you know, there are a lot of di different decisions to be made about uh, the appropriateness of that gift and what it says about the relationship. So the individual is embedded, situated in these overlapping social relations, technologies that are encountered and used at every turn, and configurations of technologies and social structures together. Um, together, these uh, are what Ari Rip and Renee Kemp called configurations that work. All right? So you set up patterns of your behavior, practices, to, you know, at some level get you through the day, right? So lunch has a series of behaviors that you engage in to, to uh, actually do that, or an alternative series of behaviors where you stay in or go out. Um, if you're writing a paper, you have a series of practices that you, that you have put together that help you do that, that allow you to do that, to get to that point. 
so all of these things, all of these daily practices have these configurations that support what you have decided to do. And if they work, even clumsily, or sometimes inconveniently, we tend to reproduce them. We tend not to examine them too closely. And in fact, if we didn't do that, if we didn't let things recede into the background, if we had to make these decisions uh, on, uh, on all the ways that we interact with our, with our social and technological situation, uh, we would all quickly become mental basket cases. We had to make every decision consciously over and over again. And yet, even though we see that the individual has a context, we persist in what Elizabeth Shove calls the ABC paradigm, attitude, behavior, choice. We continue to simplify by trying to persuade or control, cajole individuals it, to change behavior at these energy sort of points of use instead of recognizing these behavior as parts of configurations that are supported by the technologies and the social structures and the infrastructures that are around them. Of course, the other approach is to black box individuals and you know, sort of say they're all alike, they're per capita and they're whatever, um, and say technology is the only thing that matters. And I think that's an equally pernicious sort of way to do things. Um, leads to a lot of uh, distortions and uh, gaps between what we hope for those wonderful technologies and what we actually get. It can result, for example, in increasingly efficient automobiles and people that just drive more, resulting in the planet not noticing, right? But what if we looked at individuals, at technologies, and social structures, um, institutions together? Uh, we would turn our attention to the ways hard and soft structures that have developed that effectively steer those choices of individuals and that work, that accomplish daily work, nourishment, comfort, other activities. We'd heed and build on uh, some of our urban planners like Jane Jacobs, Elizabeth Show, others to discover how government, business, and other institutional actors actually config configure the fabric and texture of everyday life as well as how individuals act in, within those configurations. Conditions within, US which, within which US residents operate include typically the need to own a car, uh, to use electricity from the available resources, to buy houses that actually are sitting there waiting to be bought, and so on. Um, so these citizen consumers then become carriers of practice. So this reframes the role of the individual as one part of a changing landscape. Uh, what I'm suggesting is that if we flatten this landscape, and I have uh, a flattening here, uh, this is a, a, the beginning of a thought experiment. I shouldn't call it a thought experiment. It's the beginning, first level. So what elements are involved in driving to work? And I'm put, deliberately put individuals off to the side. I've got. Um, after uh, careful thought, haha, -ha, I've uh, 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 colored the boxes to look at uh, sort of individual and uh, technological and institutional elements. Um, but what we see from this is that there are so many things that are involved that just telling people not to drive to, or to save the planet or just providing subsidies for uh, your preferred transportation modes, it's not going to work. You have to figure out what people are trying to accomplish when they drive to work. And it's not just getting from A to B. Um, and then look at ways to support the change that you want to see. So you need to look at the whole practice, determine feasible interventions in time and space. So you might be able to do something now with a good campaign. Uh, next year, you're going to be able to support that perhaps by providing subsidies of some kind or, of, or by meeting needs that you see that people are fulfilling in the configurations that are there. Assess the potential for changing the practice to a new configuration. See what that configuration looks like and what you would need in your workplace. This is my realm of uh, practice now um, to, to support that new configuration. 
support the configuration you want. You might not be able to support it all now, but you, you've got a plan. You can communicate that plan. And then intervene when and where possible, where it's important. See what happens. Intervene again, because it's a process. Thanks. <laughs>